Hi, everybody. Welcome to this session of expert research talks. Um, for those watching at home, welcome. And please, um, we're going to have our first presenter come up and then we can pause to take questions before we go on to the next presenter. And um, if you're watching from home, please submit your questions through um, the app. Well, actually, I forget where it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's intuitive where it is, but I, I will find your questions and we'll go through them after this first presenter. So I'd like to welcome um, Dr. Graham Collinage. Thank you very much. So this is a fantastic conference. I've really enjoyed it up until now. So if there's any organizers present, brilliant. Just wanted to be able to present here. Um, I'm gonna present some data which is unpublished. We're planning to write it up shortly, so looking forward to getting some feedback, critical or otherwise. Um, but I thought I'd also start by just introducing myself and how I got into the green field. So I wanted to be a footballer, that's soccer in, in American, but I realized even my dog was better than me. <laughs> but I was at the University of Bristol where on the faculty in the Department of Pharmacology was Jeff Watkins, who is the father of the glutamate receptor field. I mean, he's done more than anybody to identify amperceptors, knet receptors, and of course, MDA receptors. So I became inspired to work on MDA receptors and have been doing so for my whole career. But in terms of GRIN, my involvement in the GRIN project started on this date. And I know this date because it's a date that England qualified for the semi-final of the World Cup. Uh, this is in Toronto. There's a load of England supporters like me. Everybody was drinking vast quantities of alcohol except me, I was drinking vast quantities of coffee because in the afternoon, Amy Ramsey had invited me to talk to a small NMDA receptor group organized by Keith MacArthur. And this was when I met Keith and his wonderful son, Bryson. And he said to me, is there anything as an NMDA receptor researcher we could perhaps do? Um, and what I'd realized moving to Toronto is that they had a fantastic mouse facility. So I said, well, we'll try and make the mouse with the same variant as, as Bryson. And I said, we could probably make a second one as well. So he suggested I made this second variant, I say I, uh, the Center for Phenogenomics, uh, which is a, a Mount Sinai and Sick Kids run facility. So we, we, we made these two mouse models. And so what I'm gonna do is give a presentation of our phenotypic characterization that's been going on now for a few years. Um, so just a little bit recap, they're both uh, in the GRIN1 gene, they're both glycine to arginine mutations in different locations. So the G6, oh, it's too difficult for me to control this. The G620R, so if anybody went to um, Junior's poster or his brief presentation yesterday, I'll be re-presenting some of that data on the left-hand side, and I'll be showing for the first time the comparison with the G827R on the right-hand side. And what I can say is because these animals come from the same facility, all the experiments have been done in the same lab by the same researchers, I think you can confidently say that if there's the similarities are genuine similarities and differences are genuine differences, it's not some kind of cross lab uh, effect because of different levels of stress or animal housing, et cetera. So we know quite a bit about these receptors when they've been expressed in recombinant systems, mainly from the Trinellis lab and a few others around the world. So I've listed these um, references here. What we knew is that these have a profound effect on the NMDA receptor, but what we wanted to know is what does this translate to in the native environment of a synapse in the mammalian system? So the first thing is that the mice uh, were born fine. Uh, the 827s were more difficult, but we're now getting them breeding pretty well. We never see any homozygous mice, uh, presumably because it's uh, embryonic lethal. The hets are a bit smaller in both cases, and they're lighter than their wide type uh, counterparts. And I'm not gonna present much behavioral data today, but in addition to reduced body size and weight, they have locomotive deficits, increased startle response, increased tolerance to thermal pain. Well, this is the 620 hours. We haven't done much behavioral characterization of the 827s yet. And a few other uh, learning deficits um, that Ginny uh, mentioned yesterday. In terms of the gross brain anatomy at the level we've looked at, which are just nissel stains, there's no obvious difference. Uh, cell counts are about the same. 
So this is the first perhaps surprise because we know from a, a lot of literature that the NMD receptor is very important in development, but we don't see any obvious gross abnormalities suggesting that the one uh, good copy is sufficient for the general wiring of, of the brain. So the electrophysiological characterization has been performed by uh, Patrick Tidball, who's done most of the field potential recording, and Junior has done most of the patch clamp recording. So the standard protocol that we used, I'll eventually learn how to get this to work, um, is to record field excitatory post-factor potentials from the shaft-lateral commissural pathway. These are blocked by amperceptor antagonists, so this amperceptor mediated synaptic transmission. We can block amperceptor mediated synaptic transmission with MBQX. Um, lower the magnesium concentration and record NMDA receptor mediated synaptic responses, which are blocked by AP5. And so this way we can look at amperceptor mediated synaptic transmission and NMDA receptor mediated synaptic transmission directly. And for the wholesale recording, uh, again, looking at amper and NMDA, NMDA receptor currents uh, and spontaneous uh, and miniature evoked uh, uh, synaptic currents. So the first thing is um, we looked at the size of the synaptic responses, um, starting with the presynaptic fiber volley, which is this tiny little uh, component here, which is the axons coming down, or the action potentials coming down the axons. And if we plot the amplitude of the fiber volley against the stimulus intensity, then there's no difference, suggesting that on average, you've got the same amount of connectivity in the HETs as you have in the wild types. And the same is true for the 827 Rs as well. So again, this is consistent with no obvious gross abnormalities. And again, it's suggesting that the, the, the development has, has gone in, is fine, it's normal. In terms of amperoceptive mediated synaptic transmission, this is also normal in the 620 Rs. So here, what we're doing is we're plotting the size of the slope of the field excitatory post factor potential as a function of fiber volley amplitude. As you can see, they're superimposable. So amper transmission is also normal in this mouse. The first surprise, however, is in the 827Rs, the amper receptor mediated synaptic transmission is actually enhanced slightly, but highly significantly. So you've actually got more amper receptor mediated synaptic transmission in the HETs than, the, the, than, uh, than you'd expect. In terms of the underlying mechanism for that, we looked at... Um, Pair pulse facilitation, which is an index of presynaptic release probability. And there was no difference here in the uh, 620 hours. Um, but in the uh, 827 hours, there's a change in the uh, pair pulse facilitation, which is consistent with an increase in the probability of release, suggesting that in this mouse model, the amperoceptive mediated transmission is increased because of an increase in the prob probability of release. And that is confirmed by looking at the uh, spontaneous and miniature um, responses, no, no difference in the 620 hours, and an increase in the mini frequency in the 827 hours. So this was the first surprise, and that is amperoceptive medi mediated transmission is actually enhanced in this mouse model. But what, we're, of course, we're really interested in is NMDA receptors, because this is a variance are within the NMDA receptor. So uh, in the 620R, there is a substantial reduction in NMDA receptor mediated synaptic transmission, uh, as you can see, down by over 50%. And in the 827Rs, it's an even greater reduction in NMDA receptor mediated synaptic transmission, down to about 75% uh, reduction. So this is exactly what you'd expect. And we assume that the increase in AMPRA is some form of compensation uh, to counteract this dramatic reduction in NMDA receptor mediated synaptic transmission. So one of the properties that uh, have uh, been identified by Steve Tronellis in the recombinant systems is there's a change in magnesium sensitivity in the 620 hours. So we assumed that we might see something similar if we looked at the synaptic responses. Um, but indeed, what we found was that they, we couldn't detect a change in magnesium sensitivity of these receptors uh, when they're at the surface of the membrane, assuming they are making it to the surface of the membrane. So this is looking at the NMDA receptor mediated synaptic response with increasing concentrations of magnesium. So as you increase the magnesium concentration, you've got more and more of the uh, 
response. And this is a superimposition of the wild type and the hets. And you can see there's really no difference in their magnesium sensitivity. And we did the same experiments with the 827Rs. And again, there was no obvious difference in the magnesium sensitivities. We suggest that in the native environment, they're behaving differently, or perhaps they're not actually making it to the surface of the membrane, which is what we assumed was the case for a while. And another way of looking at this was to look at the current voltage response by isolating the NMDA currents, um, um, measuring the NMDA receptor synaptic currents of the membrane potentials. And there are slight differences, but nothing to really suggest that there's anything major going on here. So we'll conclude that actually the voltage dependence of the magnesium block is unaltered in these, uh, in, in these mice. The other next surprising observation, however, is that when we looked more carefully at the kinetics of the synaptic currents, there was a small reduction in the uh, decay kinetics in the 620 hours. Now, I have to admit that I didn't believe this for a long time, and Junior would know that he's trying to convince me this is a real observation. I said, no, 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 no. it's got to be a space clamp artifact, because we're trying to clamp uh, these, these cells with massive dendrites. But eventually, he convinced me it's real. And one of the reasons uh, I now believe it is that when we look at the uh, 827R, even though this is a more dramatic reduction in, in the MDA response, there's essentially no change in the kinetics. So of course, what we've done here is we've peak scaled these responses. This will be a, a lot smaller than the wild type, but you can see that the, the decay kinetics are essentially identical. Whereas here, there's a small but highly significant difference in the, in the kinetics of response. And you might wonder what, why is that important? That's important because it's telling us that the receptors are probably getting to the surface and they're having different properties. Whereas this one, it could be due to the fact that it's a trafficking uh, deficit. Um, so one possibility we imagined is what could be possible is that with a, a reduction in the glue N1 subunit, you're getting a different assembly of subunits at the surface, and that could explain the kinetic difference. So very recently, we've looked at some experiments. This is using field potential recording again, where we looked at the sensitivity of MVP, which is a glue A um, and glue N1, uh, 2A, uh, more selective whereas rho at this concentration is very selective for glue M1, 2Bs. And there is a small sensitivity uh, under, in the wild type, suggesting that some of the receptors here are uh, di uh, heterodimers, whereas the vast majority are probably heterotrimers. And we're seeing a small but significant difference in rho sensitivity. So this would be consistent with the wild type receptors having more glue N2B dihetromeric assemblies, and then in the um, knockouts, this, this, this is reduced, and therefore we're having more of the triheteromerics with the same sensitivity MVP. Right. Finally, the thing that I'm most interested in, which is synaptic plasticity. Um, so because NMDA receptors are profoundly affected, one would predict, or one would hope, or I would certainly hope, that if you have less NMDA receptor activation, you have less LTP. And indeed, that's what we found. So in the eight, uh, 620 hours, the LTP is reduced by about 50%. And in the 827 hours, where the inhibition of the NMDA response is even greater, the LTP is practically abolished. So there is a profound reduction in synaptic plasticity in these mice. And that is widely believed that this plasticity underlies learning and memory and other cognitive deficits. So I would predict that this is the reason that we get cognitive uh, problems uh, in, in patients who have these, these same variants. Okay. So we're at the point now of wondering whether what we're seeing uh, is less native receptors because the mutant receptors are not being assembled or they're not being trafficked properly, or whether we're getting expression of the variants, but they're less effective when they're at the synapse. And a clue to that may be the case is the alteration in the kinetics of, of the response. So again, very recently, what we've been doing is doing some biochemistry. Um, so what we're showing here is the total um, expression 
in the wild type and the heads of the glue one subunit. And this is the surface of the synaptic, the synaptosome preparation using biotinylation. And you can see essentially there's no difference in the total expression of the synaptic surface expression of the 620Rs. In contrast, when we look at the 827Rs, again, there's no difference in the total expression of the glue M1 subunits, but the surface expression is dramatically reduced around about 50% reduction in surface expression. So what we think is happening is that in the 620Rs, we're getting expression of receptors which comprise some regular wild types, but also some um, with the uh, subunit with the variant in. And these are generating a smaller current with different kinetics due to the slightly difference in the, the subunit assembly. Whereas in the A27Rs, it's more straightforward. We're not getting assembly of receptors. They're not getting to the surface. And so what we're seeing is the residual response from the wild type receptors. So in summary, we can conclude that the uh, 620Rs and the A27R green mouse models have substantially reduced NMDA receptor dependent synaptic transmission and LTP. The, uh, the effect is larger in the A27R than the 620R. And we believe that different underlying mechanisms uh, responsible for the reduction in NMDA receptor function in these two mouse models. So in the 620R, we think it's due to the presence of variant subunits, the surface, uh, whereas with the 827R, we're pretty convinced that there's actually a reduction in the number of receptors expressed. So it's just the wild type receptors that are being expressed. We don't see any significant impact on gross brain anatomy, cortical number, uh, or connectivity. I'm not saying there aren't subtle differences. We haven't looked in great detail, but superficially at least, the brains seem okay. And that's, I think, really, really good news because if the brains seem developed okay, and we can rescue, acutely rescue the NMDA receptor a phenotype either with uh, drugs or with gene replacement, then I'd be optimistic that we should get a, a fairly good recovery or at least some function. Uh, and there was a compensatory mechanism we picked up in the 827R mice uh, that was not seen in the 620s. And I think that's because of the profound reduction in embryo receptor mediated transmissions led to some compensatory mechanism leading to an increase in the probability of release of glutamate to increase the ambient receptor mediated synaptic transmission. Okay, so I've gone through that quicker than I anticipated. So it just remains for me to acknowledge that the work has all been done at the uh, Lundefeld Tanban Research Institute, Mount Sinai Hospital. Uh, also, the animals are generated at the TCP, which is the building next door. I also have a position at the University of Toronto. The work that I've described, uh, Junior who presented the postman sitting there will answer all the difficult questions. Uh, has, and along with Patrick has done all the electrophysiology. Um, Yesel and Shinwon did some behavior. I haven't had time to go through the behavior, um, but that's still ongoing. Uh, Jonathan Thacker did the biochemistry at the end. Lucy did the anatomy. John has been looking after the project. And my picture's in black and white because it's such an old, <laughs> old picture. Uh, I've, 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 I've been involved in the background. So thank you very much. If you'd like the questions to be picked up, on your recording. Hi, uh, nice talk. Uh, I was wondering if uh, I'm picking up on this kinetics of the decay, the yeah. faster kinetics. Have you looked at what happens in current climb and integration towards action potential? Just the fact. Okay, so in terms of the kinetics, it was all done under voltage clamp. So it's the only way we can really get an accurate measurement of the kinetics. Well, the main question is really have you tried current clamp? Um, I don't think we have. Not that I'm aware of. No, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally on top of what's going on, as you can tell. <laughs> um, but with the field potential recording, of course, that is giving you a, a, 
an estimation of what's happening at population of neurons which have not been clamped. But we don't see it. I mean, the, the, the transmission looks pretty normal apart from the reduction in, in the OSEPs mediated transmission. We don't see any hint of loss of inhibition. We don't see any hint of epileptiform activity. So we can discuss afterwards, but in, in the fat mouse model, what we've seen is that, that the EPSP duration affects spike timing. And that can, on top of everything else, can also relate to information processing and, and deficits there. Yeah, so which mouse was that again? And Dravet syndrome mouse model, so okay. not, not green. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a question there. Thank you, that was very nice work. Um, questions are, one, um, what's, why is it that these two missense variants are so different at an electro physiological level? Yeah. And two, does that correlate with clinical phenotype in any way? Okay, so good questions. Well, I'm sure the answer to that is the region of the receptor that's been affected, because although it's the same amino acid substitution, they're different regions of the NMV receptor. Um, so one is critically involved in the assembly, uh, and that's why we don't think we're getting assembly of the receptors in the uh, A27s. Um, sorry, what's the second question? Does this correlate with the clinical phenotype in the patient? Yeah, as far as we know, I mean, it's obviously difficult to do a direct comparison between a mouse and a human being, but say, for example, the body weight is consistent with my understanding of what happens to the a small number of patients with that same variant. Um, the hypertonia, which I think we're going to pick up with the locomotor problems, is consistent. Intellectual deficits are consistent. So as far as we can tell, there's a lot of similarities. I think the thermal sensitivity is being picked up as well as a experience uh, in, in, in the children. But we're in the process of compiling an up-to-date list of the human phenotypes Thanks to Tim. <laughs> um, so we'll be able to answer that question uh, more thoroughly. In because the, time. the practical implication is, you know, if there's a way to predict the phenotypic severity based on genotype, um, that would be incredibly helpful, especially yeah. on missense variant, because so you know, we, there we see are a patient programs. with that. Yeah. We, we was talked yesterday, I think, about a program trying to do to predict the outcome based on the amino acid substitution which was running at about 80 to 90% accuracy, I believe. Um, but ultimately, I think you have to do the experiment in the mouse model. I mean, Steve will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in some of your studies, the initial prediction was the um, 620 was a gain of function because of reduced magnesium sensitivity in the recombinant system. Is that right? That, that was right until you did the biochemical circuits. Yeah. 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 OK. So. Yeah. So ultimately, whilst the recombinant system is really good for getting an accurate estimation of what's happening, ultimately, I think it has to be done in the mouse as well to, to know the uh, to study the receptor in its native environment. So I think I would really need to do a different mouse for each variant. And each one of these runs at about half a million to a million dollars. <laughs> in terms of making them, maintaining them, paying for people to do the experiments, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Gonna be uh, less technical, I suspect, but... Mm -hmm. um, because you talked about, or maybe the question won't make sense, but um, this presence of variant, the variant subunits in the G620R. Yeah. So when we think about um, what that means, of course, then as parents, we jump to, so what does that mean in terms of, you know, um, would you want to reduce that expression? Like, are there things yeah. that we can start to consider now as a result, knowing that? Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to know that. Um, to design the right approach. Um, it's more complicated if you've got variants expressed at the synapse. If you've just got a knockdown, then uh, an increase in the number of the native receptors would, would be the logical way to go. Probably putting in more native receptors would work as well, because the more native receptors, the greater probability of, of obtaining native receptors at the synapse. 
but there's always going to be that competition with of the express variant receptors. So ultimately, we have to try, uh, and we will try. I mean, what what is good about this is the phenotypes are so clear. I mean, they are massive reductions, and they're very consistent. Um, so if it's possible to rescue, we should be able to see it. Thank you, and thank you for all the work that you've done, and to your team as well. So, Genial. Right, so I don't think I saw it. When you do the biotinylation to look at the surface expression and you see the trafficking defect, did you do 2A and 2B as well? I was dreading you asking me a biotinylation question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, this is a nice one. Well, I, I can, some... <laughs> no, I can answer that. I can answer I have some that. other ones, right? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't yet, but we, we're going to, obviously, because it'll be really nice to see if there's a subunit switch or change. Well, because it seems it seems like a profound deficit, right? So, you, yeah. I mean, and if blue in and one's not on the surface, then nothing is. I mean, that well, that you, deficit should be. Yeah, so so it should definitely go down where the glue in one goes down, but in the one where the glue in one doesn't change. Yeah, 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 right. Our prediction is that there may be more, less B. So we may, but it's going to be very small. So whether we will pick it up or not, I don't know. To explain the kinetic shift. But, um, we'll try, and if we struggle, I'll come. <laughs> I'll, I'll say help. 